Well, as I promised the last time, uh, we were going to come to some positive things this time, right? We, we did our negatives, we did our prejudice, we did our, uh, our aggression. So now we're going to talk about attraction, liking, loving, and then in the next chapter, actually the behavior of helping. So we can actually start to talk about something a little more positive in life. So what leads to attraction? Well, first off, I, I want to start with something very simple. We have this inherent need to, to belong. It's a motivation to bond with others in relationships to provide ongoing positive interactions. Okay. Um, my dog has a need to belong. I mean, it's pretty strong. He sit, he'll sit outside the shower waiting for me while I'm getting myself ready in the morning. He sits there, waits in the bedroom. And then when I go downstairs, he go downstairs. I'm, a, I'm amazed, by the way, too, because... There's food in the kitchen. My wife is preparing breakfast. And he think, you know, and normally you'd think that dog would know that he could get scraps or something from her. But he sits there and he waits there so patient. He's so pretty. Uh, so, you know, it's a pretty deep-seated need uh, for all humans and, and apparently dumb dogs, okay? Um, in fact, this need to belong is so strong, you take a look at the picture on the right. Right here, the two brain images. We see that um, the uh, different parts of your brain that respond to ostracism, the, the acts of excluding or ignoring somebody, these parts of the brain are the same parts of the brain you feel when uh, that, that fire when you feel pain. Very similar areas. So literally, this this ostracism is a pain in your brain. It it fires the same way. We find that this ostracism leads to some real negative consequences. We see on the left there, um, the the Columbine shooters, and it, it, that, that they were ostracized. Is ostracism causing? Well, I don't know, but I mean, clearly, this is a big deal. This need to belong. Well, what is it that, that uh, predicts friendship or attraction? And that's proximity, obviously geographical newness. Um, it's hard to be friends or uh, girlfriends or something with somebody if she's on the opposite side of the world, right? Uh, more than just proximity, but rather functional distance. That is to say, I have a neighbor. He's five feet away from my... Well, okay, my living room is probably... 10 feet tops from his house, you know, if you measure it out from the edge of my home. And uh, yet, honestly, never even met the guy. Don't know his name, don't know what he does. Uh, he's been living there about eight months, and he is never, I've, I've, I've seen him very briefly, twice, I think, maybe uh, park his car in the driveway and walk in the house. That's it. That's all I've ever seen. Okay, so clearly, even though our proximity is high, our functional distance is quite low. All right, so that 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 just doesn't work. Um, likewise, anticipatory liking. If we're if we expect to like somebody, then it, it's more likely that we will like somebody. I mean, that's a self fulfilling prophecy right there, right? And of course, mere exposure. And this ought to be something we've seen before. Uh, the tendency for novel stimuli to be liked more or rated more positively after the rater has been repeatedly exposed to them. And it could be uh, faces. So more often you see them, the more attractive they become. Or Chinese characters. That's what this, this image here is on the right, um, bottom right. The more we see Turkish words, you know, the more pleasant they sound or something. And this shouldn't surprise us because this next graph is awfully familiar. Come on, I know it's coming. There it is. The availability here, or the uh, cut, paste, slash, whatever, the uh, recognition heuristic. And you recall, the recognition heuristic is a deep, deep, deep burned in thing. Because, I mean, seriously, you know, John is coming up to me, and I interacted with John before, and I'm still alive, so I kind of assume that John is, in fact, not going to kill me. Right, but this other dude, I don't know who he is, so who knows what's going to happen. I mean, this is deep, deep seated in us that we are, we, we prefer, are attracted to um, things that we're familiar with. This is a deep one. Well, it turns out that what we consider attractive is, a, is really a factor of the culture we grow up in and those things that we're exposed to the most often. Um, just the other day, I was um, looking back at an old picture of mine, an old, uh, an old college picture. And in that picture, I had these glasses. Man, they were the size of my my head. They were awesome. And I looked at them, I'm like, how incredibly ugly that was. But, you know, at the time, 
it was completely normal. That's just, well, I've never been completely normal. It, I think you get the idea. And so we find that um, we look back on it, and it's like, I haven't seen that in a long time, and it looks weird. Well, I never grew up with um, a woman with filed off teeth and um, uh, tattoos down her face. How about the lipstick woman? <laughs> I like the lipstick woman. Um, she makes me imagine holding one of these um, these big kindergarten pencils, you know, the, the big wide ones. <laughs> Somebody needs to help her. <laughs> or the woman with the plate in her mouth. There, there we go. Bottom right. Ooh, yikes. Or, of course, the top right. I don't know. I mean, whatever. I guess that's attractive. Okay? Whatever. Depends on what you grew up with. Um, a woman's attractiveness, now, you know, again, it's going to depend on, on how you define it, but a woman's tr attractiveness is a good predictor of how often she dates, but a man's attractiveness really only dates dating, uh, predicts dating frequency, uh, modestly, okay? Um, there's a lot of other factors involved. Um, women, in fact, uh, tend to, to in fact, um, in, on dating websites, women's profiles tend to emphasize appearances. Men's profiles tend to emphasize resources. Okay, and there's an evolutionary explanation for this. Men are attracted to women that can have lots and lots of babies, and uh, therefore young and uh, young and beautiful and attractive equals more babies and healthy. Whereas a man with a lot of resources equals a, a, a man that can uh, provide the resources required to raise the, the, the child, okay? So again, underneath my face here, we have an image. Um, trying to be honest as you can, are you more attracted to people by their bodies or their brains? When you ask women, 60% uh, said brains and 20% said bodies. Now, that's a lie. I know that, okay? But whatever. And men... They said, you know what? It's TNA, man. It's the body. You give me the body and the rest will follow, right? And fewer were attracted to brains. But you can't see their brains. Can't put a bikini on a brain. Um, people are attracted to healthy mates, and this makes sense because, um, again, in our ancestral past, um, those people that mated with healthy ba uh, healthy had... Those people that mated with a healthy mate were more likely to have a, a offspring that were, in fact, healthy. So we see this, um, on average, skin is the, the, the simplest way to um, directly see health or something like that. Um, there is no other way to see whether or not somebody's sick or something. And so we see this guy and... and we have an aversion to this. We do. And I mean, I know it's not politically correct and everything, but we have an aversion to this kind of a look. And uh, that's natural. That's that's the way it is. The cosmetic industry always uh, is obviously working on uh, pulling in double overtime paychecks on this one. Here's another one. Bilateral symmetry. Another marker of health is bilateral symmetry. The, you know, by that I mean... Um, a line down the center of the face, it should be exactly the same on the left and the right. Well, a mirror image, anyway. And um, any uh, genetic, there are certain genetic mutations and pathogens and stuff that would lead to development that is not perfectly symmetrical. There, ha. I see you. All right. On average, asymmetrical faces are viewed as less attractive. Okay, so this dude's face is a little bit weird. How about this woman? I think it's a woman. People perceive faces with averagely proportioned features as more attractive. Okay, this woman's features are not average by any means. There's something, and they're dis, uh, they're asymmetrical as well. Um, and and we find that this, the average facial features are considered more attractive. In fact, here, if we take a series of photos of faces and put them together to make a composite. The composite will be viewed as more attractive than 95% of the photos that make up the composite, okay? Um, they, in one study, they took a bunch of photos of Caucasians and East Asians and Eurasians and jammed them all together, and um, here's the basic images. They found that uh, this, the average Caucasian face on the far left on the top and the average Asian face on the right on the top there were uh, less attractive than if we stuck together and created a Eurasian, a Caucasian and Asian mixture 
in the middle that was a complete average. I, I don't know what the truth is on that, but that, that's what we got. Uh, but now, average facial features are considered to be attractive, but when it comes to bodies, um, we often find bodies that are um, a different from the average to be attractive. Okay, that is um, those that have um, d d different than the average. Okay, uh, the kinds of body weights that are perceived as attractive vary considerably across cultures. Sure, uh, Ford and Beach published an influential book in '51, "The Patterns of Sexuality." They concluded uh, heavier women were universally found to be more attractive. Yeah, that's true. Um, when food is scarce, then um, Thin. Uh, if skin, if, if food is scarce, then being skinny is the the, the easy thing to do, right? Because you can't get any food. Uh, therefore, being a big woman in particular would be a way of saying, "Look at my wealth. Look at how wealthy I am. I have so much extra disposable income that I can wear my wealth for the world to see." All right, it's almost like jewelry or something like this. Okay. Well, we in America have. Um, have done an amazing thing. We've mastered the thing called um, processed corn syrup. And with processed corn syrup, we have created a situation where we can go to um, go to the uh, 7-Eleven or something and spend, I, I, oh, I saw it, in fact, at the uh, quick, 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 QT, QT, whatever the place is called. And you can bring in up to 200-ounce beverage container and fill it for like 99 cents I mean I don't remember the exact numbers but it was just craziness and if you look at the number of calories in that it's like you could come in and fill a bucket with 200 ounces of liquid and spend one dollar and have what is that 15 20 thousand calories or some shit like that for 99 cents so clearly we've mastered the art of processed corn syrup and therefore food is plentiful and therefore the difficult body to achieve is, in fact, the thin one. So we have um, completely thrown that into the into the up in the air here. Here we find on the top the traditional um, images of what would be beautiful, and on the bottom we see what the modern definition of beautiful is. Just modern, only modern has that image portrayed. Ah, the matching phenomenon of physical attractiveness this is kind of interesting. The tendency for men and women to choose as partners those who are a good match in attractiveness and other traits. And here we got this really great one. Uh, finally, uh, frankly, I'm insulted that you asked me out. It means you think we're about the same level of attractiveness. Now, she's obviously way more attractive than him. You'd better have one heck of a sexy car. And he's like, Baby, it's electric. <laughs> you can't get no sexier than that. I don't work. So, um, but if one person is more attractive, they can bring something to the relationship in other ways too. You know, so it's not just a match on physical attractiveness. Like um, I've always been amazed that Hugh Hefner, the um, the the Playboy guy, can uh, get keep getting himself these young women. These are very attractive women. These, well, bunnies, frankly. And the reason he can is because he brings something to the relationship, their ability to become Playboy bunnies. Um, related to this whole thing is the physical attractiveness stereotype. There is this presumption that physically attractive people possess other socially desirable traits. Um, something like what is beautiful is good or something. So they did a bunch of, that. what they did was they pulled out a bunch of uh, like congressional uh, races and they laid out all the pictures, and they just had people vo vote for this uh, this co congressional race. But you don't have any information except these two pictures. And people generally were voting for the person that was more attractive, and it was just like doing nothing but looking at the faces. The more attractive person uh, won most of the time. I mean, it was just crazy how they worked it out in, in these kinds of studies. Um, even a three-month-old who doesn't hasn't yet been influenced by television and stuff, they prefer to look at attractive faces. So at three months old already, there's a preference. Um, this is crazy, though, because this is the um, um, self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, if something is more attractive, then, I mean, like we said, even a three-month-old prefers to look at it. 
attractive people are treated differently. And we know because of self-fulfilling prophecies, the very act of being treated differently creates different outcomes. And so, it, though it sounds silly to think that just because something is beautiful means it's good, yet there's there may well be a truth to it. Maybe a truth that wasn't there to begin with, but a truth which is created by the very fact that people treat them that way. So, um, there are some rules, as I said, some rules to what is considered attractive, but most of it is culturally based, okay? Most of it is culturally based. Um, do birds of a feather flock together? Yeah, generally speaking. Um, we saw that before when we talked about um, who do we hang with? We hang with people similar to ourselves. That's, that's all there is to it. And so birds of a feather flock together. The more we, more similar we find someone to be, the more we tend to like them. Okay? Uh, then that makes sense because that means we have something to talk about. Uh, friends and spouses are more likely to share political opinions, attitudes, beliefs, values. Not a surprise. Um, spouses and roommates tend to become more similar with time. Um, as a general rule, dissimilarity breeds dislike very, very deeply. Okay? Um, I'm not sure how that works. My wife has a colleague that uh, they have completely different opinions in, in every way you can imagine. Conservative, political, I mean, across the board, they're, 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 they're day and night. And uh, they get along, but uh, ooh, sometimes. Complementarity is this supposed idea that, if, um, you know, do opposites attract? Oh, sure, you know, she's my yin for her yang, and we fit together like two pieces of a puzzle. And yeah, once in a while you're going to find that, but by far the majority of the time, birds of a feather flock together is much more important, much more true. Um, rarely do you find complementarity in relationships. Almost always you find coming together. I like this one, Marlene Dietrich. Now, I'm too young to really know a Marlene Dietrich, okay? But here's her quote, and it's a wonderful quote, by the way. The average man is more interested in a woman who is interested in him than he is in a woman with beautiful legs, okay? Now, that is that is clever. In fact, it, it reminds me of an old, uh, an old Eddie Murphy skit. Uh... He used to put out these comedy albums, and uh, my, my friends and I, we'd, get, we'd sneak bootleg copies of the comedy albums, and uh, when mom wasn't home, because, dude, you don't listen to Eddie Murphy, man. That was, I mean, come on, they were called, like, Raw. And on one of them, he, uh, he talks about the scenario, uh, he says, you ever notice you're walking down the street, and there's this pretty little, you know, this is a good-looking dude, you know, this good-looking dude, and he's got this girl, and he's like, What's wrong? How is it possible that that ugly girl could have that attractive dude? And then comes Eddie Murphy's response. He goes, she catered to his ego. That's what she did. She catered to his ego. And that's what ingratiation really is, right? The use of strategies such as flattery to get another's favor. And ingratiation works well not just in romantic relationships, but in any relationship. You know, you, oh, you did good. You know, I mean, in any, you know, Sometimes people agree with the boss just to seek favor, things like this. Um, it works particularly well uh, for people who have a low self-esteem or something because their egos seem to be hungry for the flattery or something. But obviously, ingratiation or, or this empty, empty praising over and over and over eventually runs out of steam, right? It's going to run out of power eventually. All right, here's another perhaps... Uh, explanation for attraction, the reward theory of attraction. Uh, we like those people that reward us or those people that we associate with rewarding events. So we have this woman on the far left. Okay, those are them glasses I was talking about, by the way. Holy balls, those are awesome. Now, I think, by the way, that was my date to the eighth grade prom. I'm not positive, but I think she was, all right? If not, it was her twin sister. So what we got down the far uh, left there uh, is the experiment there, and she comes out, and she's either um, really, really uh, sweet or really, really angry and bitter. Then they had the participants interact with two other people on the right, okay? And then they, they uh, and by the way, that, that the middle girl there, she is a new person. Okay, that's a different person. And so if the person on the left, the experimenter, was friendly, then the participants had a preference for the, the woman in the middle there. 
And if the experimenter, the woman on the left, was, was all angry and bitter, then the participant showed a preference for the woman on the far right. Okay? But really clever. Uh, what about love? Love is interesting. I like love, right? Romantic love seems to be an evolutionary adaptation. Ooh, man, this seems kind of taken away from the lure of it. To ensure that human children who have the longest period of dependence of any species. Yeah, by the way, um, I didn't get into it because it's not that class. But uh, when human babies are born, they're just not done cooking. All right? Their brains are just... There is no animal who's who is more immature, or, or you know, compared to what their adult stage is going to be. No infant in any species anywhere has an infant who is so unprepared to deal with the world, and it's just amazing how incredibly helpless and dependent human beings are. I've got a 13-year-old. I can attest to this. Okay, absolutely helpless. Romantic love appears to be found everywhere. 89% of subsistence societies show it uh, very clearly. The other ones probably would show it if you asked a question in the right way, but sometimes, you know, they just don't know what you're asking them. Uh, that's cultural research right there, by the way. You don't know how to ask a question. Um, so, even though there seems to be this universal romantic love thing, the idea of using romantic love as a basis for marriage is a, uh, a recent Western invention. Arranged marriages have always been the most common way and still is the most common way for people that get married around the world since all time. Um, oh, this is clever. I like this one. This was... Uh, uh, oh, how can I do this without a huge thing? Okay, maybe you've seen the, um, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. With, um, um, when, a, when, a, when a duck is born, right? When the duck is born, um, and the first couple of hours there, the first moving object that that duck sees, that baby, that baby duck imprints on it, latches onto, and then it almost burns that into the brain. It's almost like, <clears throat> now that thing becomes mom. And that duck will now follow that thing forever. So now some researchers are thinking that humans have the same type of an imprinting, a burning into the brain, where they take the opposite sex parent, their, you know, my mother or a woman's father, and it imprints in there, and then we seek out, we find attractive and seek out that image. I need to find a woman that matches this template. So we kind of, we seek out our own moms. How incredibly Freudian that is. Uh, you read it, it's clever. Uh, marriage, oh, this is clever. Um, around the world, here is perhaps um, in a bunch of different pre-industrialized societies. Not These do not include, um, you know, modern Western stuff. But... Uh, we see that, you know, say parents choose the partners, individual cannot object. More women than men, but, you know, 20% of women, 20, 21% of women have the situation where mom and dad pick, and that's it. You, you're just going to live with it. Um, you see what percent next, you know, parents choose a partner, and then the individual can object. And you see this, that in, um, across the board here, what we find is that across the world, men are in situations where they have more choices in marriage than women do, that we can talk about an arranged marriage, but arranged is more arranged for the woman than the man. That when mom and dad say it, women are more obligated universally around the world to accept what mom and dad said. Not not committed, obviously, but they are more, more so than, than men. Okay? But we see individuals selects partner autonomously. You know, they select who they're going to marry. And they don't need any approval from anybody else. That's only 8% of pre-industrialized societies are women allowed to get away with that. Now, that's true romantic love. Uh, what is marriage? Oh, I like this. This is, um, I pulled this out of like a cultural anthropology book. And um, there are different culture, or different, different, uh, you know, different definitions of what is acceptable marriage. In many cultures, um, the ideal marriage is something called a cross-cousin marriage, okay? And uh, to get that, I mean, very briefly, you have to understand that, uh, see, to us, a cousin is a cousin. We don't, we don't think about this. But a cross-cousin and a parallel cousin is a distinction that most cultures, in fact, do make. 
a, a, a parallel cousin, let's stay, start with this, a parallel cousin would be your mother's sister's children. They're parallel because mom and sister. Parallel cousins would be your father's brother's children. Okay, Cross cousins would be your father's sister's children or your mother's brother's children. You, you, you get the notion. In many cultures, um, the idea of marrying a parallel cousin is just creepy. They're just looking at it going, dude, you can't marry her? Oh, my God, that's just crazy. That's your mom's sister's kid. Oh, disgusting. Okay? But um, a cross cousin is often viewed as, as not just a, a desirable marriage partner, but, in fact, the ideal marriage partner. And um, it's a little bit, little bit odd for us to, to make this distinction but yet, it, the notion behind it is to keep the wealth in the family. And this makes a lot of sense um, in a lot of ways, although you've got to be careful about inbreeding at some point. But um, what happens, of course, is that if a, if a father has, you know, three children, two boys, uh, he has to split his land in half. And they go out and get married to somebody, and then each of them has two children, and they have to cut their, you know, two sons, and each of them have to cut the land in half. And... They're two chunk, and so pretty soon, you know, father's thousand acres is like two acres a kid or something, you know? It's like, I am the prince of my domain. <laughs> yeah, no. What happens is if you have cousin marriage, then these, um, these land holdings eventually merge back together, okay? They eventually come back in and, um... Therefore, your your ancestral lands don't sort of disintegrate. Instead, they 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 just sort of shift around. Uh, marriage is interesting. Um, often involves a series of monetary exchanges. It's it's very interesting. They have things like a bride price or a dowry. Maybe um, I'll keep these two as the simplest: a bride price or a dowry. A bride price is money that the husband or the husband's family must pay to gain the woman. A dowry is money which the woman's family puts together. Woman, I mean, not just money, but gifts and things like this. And the dowries can be pretty elaborate. Uh, the money, the 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 set of things that are put together by the woman's family that is then brought into the marriage by the woman. Okay. In some ways, a dowry is a um, a insurance policy or something like that. Um, if the husband is then unfaithful, or if the husband then wants to uh, dissolve the marriage, then the woman can take the dowry with her back to her original family. Okay. It's sort of like wealth that is. Um, Hostage, right? It's held hostage by the marriage or something like that. Uh, but it's kind of an interesting thought uh, about how a um, father would view having a daughter. If you're in a society where um, that has a dowry system, you're going to view a daughter as a big liability. In order to marry her off, you've got to come up with a humongous pile of wealth. But if you're in a country that has a bride price system in place, you're going to view that daughter as a commodity, right? She's just a blessed event because... When she turns 18, I am going to get myself a huge chunk of cash for this girl, all right? And it's an interesting thing. And in fact, in um, China nowadays, they, they were traditionally a culture with a dowry system. But more recently, they've shifted over to a bride price system. And that is simply because of the, um, the one-child policy in China has created a scenario where... Um, they're basically the babies being born are about a 60% male and 40% female because, of course, these, um, they're having selective abortions. And so what's happening is that there's a lot more men than there are women, and so all of a sudden women are now much more valuable than they used to be, and they no longer need to bring a dowry into the marriage. Um, they can, in fact, demand a bride price. Uh, passionate love is a state of intense longing for union with another. Passionate lovers are absorbed. Blah, 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 blah. Romantic love, oh, it registers in the brain just like any other lovely thing like eating a Snickers bar. Okay, I don't like a Snickers bar. Three Musketeers. Give me a Three Musketeers. Although I've been turned on to 100 grands recently. Them are awesome. Man. Except I'll tell you a secret, man. You do not hide 100 grand in your car. Because what happens is they melt in the sun and then they suck. 
Um, here's a really good one. Um, the two-factor theory of emotion. I briefly, I briefly talked about the edge of this idea when I talked about Schachter and Singer's study with the, um, the, 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 the injection and is it an epinephrine or not epinephrine and do we tell them it's going to make them arouse or would we not tell them it's going to make blah, 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 blah. But anyway, this is Dutton and Aaron's study, more social psychological in nature. Um, and there's a bridge and the, uh, I'll tell you what, I, um, I went to that bridge up in Canada and I meant to get those pictures into this slideshow because I got pictures of me up on that bridge. Uh, you know, I did, just so that I could put them in here, and I, I forgot to put them in there, but you'd have to pretend that they're there, okay? So this was up at uh, Capilano, Capilano Bridge in uh, Capilano Park, up uh, north of, of uh, Vancouver. And so at this particular bridge, it's pretty scary. Can you see how scary that is? Man, they, they got a new one now, the Canyon Walk. This bitch, man, is it scarier than that bridge. That bridge is nothing compared to this canyon walk, but I'll just leave that alone. Holy crap. So now, these men are going across this bridge, and um, I'll, 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 I mean, it is fairly complicated, but I'll try to keep it simple. Um, they're going across the bridge, and um, you start on the, the right side, you go across to the left side. On the left side, there's a sitting area and stuff like that. And so what happens is this woman, she approaches these men either after they've been sitting on these benches for five minutes so that they're they're all relaxed and calmed down, or while they're in the middle of the bridge. And I'll tell you what, the first time you go across that bridge, man, is there a, an incredibly heightened state of arousal. Your heart is going, boom, boom, boom. And, I mean, your whole blood pressure is up. And, I mean, it is freaky, man. It is freaky because it is not... It, it's not, it just sort of, especially if some little teenage asshole is on there jumping. Holy crap, it makes you sick. So imagine now this woman approaches these men either while they're in the middle of the bridge or at the end of the bridge. And she asked them to do some surveys. And um, there, there was a couple of different things. In particular, there was like, uh, here's this picture of a woman. Oh, and she's just holding her hand over her face, something like this, and they say, describe the woman. And so they they rated the descriptions that people gave on um, sexual, I don't know what they had, some kind of a sexual measure for how sexual the story was. Um, and then what they did was at the end, now this, you know, this woman came up, and at the end, what they did was uh, they, they had them, uh, they, they uh, said, okay, if you want to know the results of this study, uh, here's my card. Give me a call, and we'll, you know, I'll, I'll explain it to you. Okay. And so it turns out that the men that were resting at the end of the bridge, only thirty percent of them called this woman up later to check on the results. But if she approached them while they were crossing and they were in the middle of the bridge, sixty-five percent called her up. And this was this this notion that we had talked about with Schachter and Singer that they were feeling all aroused. They were like, oh my God, I mean, you're out on that bridge, your arousal level is going to be incredibly high. And they look around and they see this woman and they're like, damn, I'm feeling awfully aroused. She must be some kind of hottie, right? And so this, this uh, what they call misattribution of arousal happens. That is to say, you're aroused, but you give you, you attribute the reason for your arousal to the wrong source. And so the two-factor theory of emotion really comes down to this. It comes down to the idea that um, in order to have emotion, you must, one, have arousal, and two, label it. Okay? And in this case, there was a misattribution, as, as indicated by the percent of men that called her. Okay? Eh, hey, whatever. This is a good story. Uh, companionate love is the affection we feel for those with whom our lives are deeply intertwined. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, here's the bad news to anybody who's in the newlywed stage. Um, romantic love goes away. It does. I mean, in every marriage, it'll always go away. And what we find is that companionate love tends to rise with, with time. So what we find is that in some cultures where they have an arranged marriage, what happens is if you have a, as long as you have a good marriage broker, what happens is that um, the marriage broker or the matchmaker or whatever you're going to call it in that country, 
Their job is to, to ensure that long-term companionate love will arise. That is to say, they, they, the marriage broker knows birds of a feather flock together. I mean, that's what they know, okay? Birds of a feather do not always fall in passionate love together, okay? Often, in fact, opposites attract in passionate love, okay? But when it comes to long-term companionate love, it's birds of a feather flock together. And so the marriage broker ensures the long-term satisfaction. So what we find is... Um, this is Rubin's Love Scale, I believe, right? Rubin's Love Scale, okay? Um, we see the green line there represents um, the love that um, people in a, a, a traditional romantic relationship, we find that their love score in the first year is 70, and in the second year is 72, and in the third year is 75. Can it get any better? And then around the seventh year, it's like 50, and then it's in the 40. Oh, shit. But in an arranged marriage, you see what happens is love starts lower, but eventually crosses over the traditional marriage and stays high and stays steady. Okay? So, in the long run, obviously, in a, a, arranged marriages lead to, I mean, it, it, these are averages, of course, but leads to more long-term happiness. There are six basic styles of love, and I don't really want to um, get into these because... Uh, I know it's not on your chest, and uh, to me, they're not that interesting. I've never really, I'm not, I mean, have I told you I'm not a touchy-feely kind of guy? This really feels like you're entering the realm of touchy-feely to me. Dude, that's creepy, man. But anyway, the point is, you know, there's um, different kinds of love. Eros and Ludos. Um, one is like love, is, uh, Eros is like passion, uh, love that is passionate. Ludus is like love that is a game or something, love to play, something. Uh, storge, uh, a love that is a friendship more than anything. Pragma is what, practical love? Yeah, practical love. <laughs> Lovely. Mania is, of course, manic love. And agape is like a, a pure Christian love or a, um, a pure uh, um selfless love something like that all right so there are different styles of love some some aspects you know some styles of love are more economic in nature some are more emotional in nature some are more perhaps spiritual in nature but there's lots of different ways that love might be uh, felt and expressed uh, here is basically uh, it's a lot of words but basically what it comes down to is uh, if you separate two people that are in love with each other, um, passionate love, their brains will, will respond in uh, very similar ways to, say, clinical depression um, or, or uh, physical pain. Uh, very similar responses. Uh, here's one that came from a, an article I wrote one time. I, uh, for a long time, I wrote articles in a uh, Korean newspaper. They were basically cultural psychology. And uh, in one particular incident I witnessed, I was at the DFW airport. We were waiting to pick up um, one of my wife's friends who was coming to visit. And uh, we were waiting at the inter international arrivals terminal, and we were watching this, This, uh, you know, it was the plane she was on, but uh, she, was, she was towards the end of her plane. I mean, she had two boys she was dragging with her. And, uh, you know, like, say, this just... Older gentleman comes out. He's maybe 45, maybe 50, something. You know, um, well-groomed, well-dressed, looked nice. He comes out, and um, there is a woman there that most certainly appears to be his wife. And, um, you know, I'm thinking, okay, now he's going to go and hug her. And, oh, I missed you. Oh, you know. He comes out. He bows to his wife and shakes her hand. And I'm like, Really? He just bowed to his wife and shook her hand? Is that right? Is that love? What, is, what the hell is that? Well, public displays of affection, PDAs, right? PDAs, public displays of affection is definitely a cultural thing. I mean, um, y y you all remember when you were uh, 15 years old, PDAs? Hell, back of the bus was a perfect place for a PDA, right? Hell, front of the bus, what do I care? Uh, even smiling is culturally determined, okay? Um, here, here, what I wrote here, though. 
I know Korean husbands love their wives and Korean parents. Oh, yeah, yeah. By the way, I was also inspired at this point by um, uh, this was very shortly after the Virginia Tech shootings. And uh, all of the details came out and the Korean community is sort of embarrassed because they kind of know um, in a Korean household, they just don't express these things they just you just don't say I love you you just don't it just doesn't happen and um, there's some beliefs that this uh, this son uh, just didn't get the feeling that he was in fact loved and accepted I mean clearly not um, there's a lot of things going on including the fact that his his sister went to Princeton which would have made him look like an absolute loser in his parents eyes um, I know Korean husbands love their wives and Korean parents love their children, but they tend to not actually say I love you. Children and husbands and wives need to hear they are loved. It can't just be assumed. My wife is a firm believer that the actual words I love you are almost more important than the actual truth. I confess that I sometimes have a hard time saying I love you out loud, but as a psychologist I can assure you that the words matter. We would all benefit by being more expressive of our affection. It's not the end of the world if someone sees you smile or laugh or even cry. Let's just say it more often. I love you. All right, whatever. Um, like I said, my, my intended audience for that was, in fact, uh, Korean people. This uh, the, These articles I wrote would then be translated into Korean and printed in the Korean newspaper. And it's scary, actually. They're making a second running in the uh, church church magazine now uh sorry i'm not writing them now and uh people are coming up to me and oh i love that article I'm like which one was it i have no idea i just gave the church magazine a copy of everything i wrote and just said go for it do what you want with them so i don't know what they are and people are coming up to me asking me questions about ones i don't remember which ones you're talking about um attachment attachment is very interesting uh, in particular, attachment between infants and caregivers is just humongous. Um, that is, uh, well, I just said a minute ago about the, the ducks and the, um, um, the, the, the first moving object they see and they imprint. This is sort of like attachment, but human infants attach not in the imprinting sense that a duck does, but human infants form an attachment to, a, to caregivers uh, that spend time with them. Uh, such that uh, at most infants, most infants will demonstrate things such as separation anxiety when that in, that uh, parent is taken away. Um, there's a lot of, and, and again, it's rooted in the preference for familiar people, right? It, it's it's part of the um, recognition heuristic that it really just beat into us. Um, but it makes a lot of sense because... Um, infants should be attached, and by the way, it works in both directions. Uh, Caregivers tend to get attached to infants as well. And it, again, there's biological truths to this. I mean, you separate the infant and the mother, and the mother, literally, her brain's going, boo, 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 pain, 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 something's not right. Okay? So it, this is a, a biological survival mechanism, right? Um, clearly, it's in the infant's best interest that both it is attracted to mom and says, Mom, Mom, I'm separated from you. And it's in the mom's best interest to be attached to the infant to protect and care for. Uh, again, did I tell you human infants are not cooked? They are absolutely helpless, helpless, helpless for a long time. Okay. Uh, other other human relationships also have attachment mechanisms that are not as biologically rooted, uh, but still important. Um, some elements are in common for all human attachment, like mutual understanding, giving and receiving support, valuing and enjoying each uh, being with the one you love. Um, we find that, uh, the, as we already said, I, well, I, here I said it, but anyway, attachment between infants and caregivers is similar to passionate love. The way that the attachment fires in the brain is the same way that passionate love fires in the brain. So it's a, really an interesting mechanism. I've always thought that love towards a spouse is much different than love toward an infant. But the way the brain responds is is uh, the same. I mean, you basically have the same mechanism going on. Uh, yeah, 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 I already said that. Adults are naturally attracted to baby-like features. Uh, in fact, my, my stupid dog is a Shih Tzu, and he's been specially bred to have infant-like features forever. So even though my dog is now like six years old or something, I don't know, I guess he's maybe four, 
Uh, my dog is four years old, but you look at him and he's just still got the features of a puppy. And he will always have the features of a puppy. And he's super duper cute, although he's a little shaggy mop. Um, infants prefer the sound of their own voices, a mother's voices. From a very early age, you know, you play two speakers and the infants will turn towards mom's voice. Um, you put down two breast pads and the infants will turn to mom's breast pad. So this attachment is, is, is deep and it is early and it is hard, okay? And we see here the evolution of Mickey Mouse. Um, Mickey Mouse on the far left there has got like rat-like features. As you see him, this is the evolution of Mickey Mouse um, across time up through the mid or early 80s. You see that they made him more baby-like. And as you see, it, he's just cuter as he goes from left to right. And the artists over at Disney know how to do that. And it has to do with how big are the eyes compared to the rest of the head. What is the distance between the tip of the nose and the tip of the ear. There are certain characteristics that obviously a cartoonist can literally put on paper. But there are certain characteristics of um, biological creatures that change with time. And infants have certain characteristics. Uh, read it. It's good stuff. Here was, uh, very briefly, this was uh, Harry Harlow's study of attachment. He um, he had these infant monkeys, and he put them in a cage, and uh, there was two mothers there. Um, you see one is a soft terry cloth mother, and the other one is a wire mother. All the food came from the wire mother. This was at a time when behaviorism was the dominant field of psychology, and so rewards and punishments were the way to describe all behavior, reinforcement theory. And so the leading uh, behaviorists were trying to describe attachment in terms of rewards and punishments. And Harry Harlow said, no, 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 no. It's not, it's comfort. It's not, it's not the reward. So he put this scenario up to find out which of these two mothers the infant would become attached to. And as you can see, um, the infant, you know, even when it's hungry, it, it will not go to the wire mother. He put up another scenario where he put up... Um, uh, I think this 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 video will link to it. It's 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 almost downright cruel to see. It's hilarious, but downright cruel to see. Um, Harry Harlow puts up this really scary mechanical toy with these teeth going ow, 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 and these big headlight eyes going blah blah, blah you know. And he hooks it up, and then he opens his little door, and the monkey is like the baby monkey to look on his eye. And that monkey, he goes and jumps for the cloth mother and grabs on for comfort and support when he's on uh, when he's scared. So clearly, um, attachment comes not from the reinforcement that the the caregiver provides, but from the comfort that the relationship creates. Here's an, a little image of um, the monkey when you put him into a strange situation without the cloth mother. This is how the uh, monkey will react. So. Clearly, this monkey has attached in some ways that um, to the to the comfort. Um, this is not uh, developmental psychology class, but attachment comes in four different styles: secure, preoccupied, dismissive, and fearful. Um, you take a take a development class to get the details on it, but suffice it to say, not all attachments are the same. Uh, a secure attachment is attachment which is rooted in trust and marked by intimacy. Clearly, um, this monkey does not have an attachment that is marked by intimacy and trust, right? I mean, come on, it's, you know, an absolutely, utterly unresponsive mother. And so the relationship between the infant and the mother, in many ways, uh, determines the type of attachment that arises. And so, of course, this is a uh, combination of... Um, the, the mother's parenting style combined with the child's personality factors or perhaps temperamental factors that they bring into the situation. Um, children that are, in fact, securely attached, when you follow them up later in life, do, in fact, have higher levels of um, social competence. Um, you know, these are just uh, correlations. There are three other styles of attachment which are considered in American culture to be uh, less healthy. Um, that doesn't seem particularly right to me, especially when you look at this. Here in America, you see that um, in the middle of middle the middle uh, set of bar bars there, 
the, the blue line is the tallest, indicating that within America, the most common type of an attachment style is, in fact, secure attachment, the good one. And so we talk about secure as good and predicting healthy psychological functioning and shit like that. But you find in other parts of the world that uh, German infants avoidance attachment is the most common. It, among Israeli uh, children that grew up in an Israeli kibbutz, the anxious, ambivalent style of attachment is the most common. And I can understand why we would look at um, secure attachment as like the best, but it feels kind of ethnocentric to me to say just because it's the most common thing in America I means it's the best thing in the world. And it's like, okay, I don't I don't know. I think that these attachment styles are 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 predicted not just by the parents thing style and the infants temperament but also by cultural factors that are involved and it's not necessarily a bad thing um, I don't know I, 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 I'm just gonna let it go but I think it's ethnocentric to say that secure attachment is the best now that was a boo-boo there it is all right um, and other and, and also in close relationships, and we, we saw sort of saw it earlier with a matching phenomenon. But equity, and as I you know, and in fact I, I said I sort of blew over, but I told you that love comes in a lot of different flavors, from romantic love to um, like almost a Christian pure love and uh, an unselfish love. But yet, underlying almost all love is in fact a um, economic relationship. Okay, love is an economic relationship. Now, there's something there to it. There's something to it. Um, all relationships, all relationships have a, you must have equity. Equity is a condition in which the outcomes people receive from a relationship are proportional to what they contributed to it. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean equal, okay? Um, and like say, um, like I said, Hugh Hefner brings in, I am the CEO of Playboy, and I have the Playboy Mansion, and I'm famous. And she has, I have big old boobies, and I'm young. So, they bring in different things, but what this theory posits is that, um, they've, that, that, that somehow Hugh Hefner and his Playboy bunny wife are, um, uh, Putting a, putting these things on a balancing scale, and and they're weighing them and going, well, I believe they're equal. And what happens is marital distress arises when one side views that they are putting more into the relationship than they are receiving from the relationship. And uh, this is true business, man. But you got to be you got to be aware that these are perceived perceived. Um, some people are uh, able to tolerate perceived inequity more than other people are willing to tolerate perceived inequity. Okay. Uh, Self-disclosure uh, enables close relationships. Uh, yeah, yeah, disclosing, becoming part of. Yeah, you know what self-disclosure does, though? I mean, it's all lovely and everything, but uh, after about 10 years of marriage, you got nothing left to disclose, buddy. Mm -hmm. uh, ah, how do they end? Individualistic countries have a higher divorce rate than collectivistic countries, though these are changing, by the way. These numbers are changing amazingly. Individualists often put more pressure on a relationship or to provide passion and personal fulfillment. Um, when I came into this relationship, I had this passionate love. Remember, passionate love responds in the brain just like you're eating a lovely candy bar. How come you can't give me that feeling now, you know, it's 10 years later, and it's like, dude, did you see the graphs, okay, did you see the pictures, and yet, um, that was the reason they got married in the first place, and so there's a high expectation, I'm not getting what I want out of this relationship, so I'm out of here, okay, um, collectivists, uh, people in collectivistic cultures are much more likely to um, be worried about what other people think, and therefore that will be a an economic, almost an economic consideration that if I divorce, um, my family will suffer consequences, they will get a bad name, something like that. Uh, narcissists have a higher rate of divorce, that makes sense. Um, however, personally, I don't, per people usually stay married. Uh, they're much more likely if they married after the age of 20. Again, these are correlational. But 
people that get married before the age of 20 are much more likely to divorce than people that, that marry after the age of 20. Um, they usually stay married if both grew up in a stable two-parent homes, okay, so that they have a model for it. Uh, if they dated for a long while before marriage, yeah, so that they know what they're getting into. Um, if they're both um, well-educated, uh, again, if they're well-educated, then they're probably more financially stable, right? Um, and, and hence the next one, enjoy a stable income from a good job. But also if they're similarly educated, and again, that's got to do with the equity kind of a thing. They're more likely to stay married if they live in a small town or on a farm. And um, that's probably got to do with the fact that um, within America, there's a, a large um, on collectivism individual. In America, we tend to be more individualistic. Uh, however, there are parts of America that are more collectivistic in nature. And people living in small towns or on farms are more likely to be collectivistic by nature. And we already just said it. People that are collectivistic are less likely to get divorced. People usually stay married if they did not cohabit or become pregnant before marriage. Yeah, because if people cohabit or become pregnant, then all of a sudden it uh, sometimes becomes the explanation for why they got married rather than we did it because we wanted to. Uh, also, they're more likely to stay married if they are religiously committed. Um, yeah, it's because of what it says in the book. Um, and again, they're more likely to stay married if they're of similar age, faith, and education. And again, that's just birds of a feather flock together, right? Detaching, the end of divorce doesn't like, or the end of a marriage doesn't like happen in an instant, okay? It happens, um slowly and gradually we find um it uh whatever i mean here here we got it this is pretty good um wait oh percent who say uh they're very happy with life as a whole i gotcha people who say that their marriage is very happy 60 percent of them say my my life is good as a whole people that say their marriage is pretty happy then only 11 percent say my life is good as a whole and if people say their marriage is not very happy, then only 5% say their life is, okay? And so what we find is that um, if, if you're not happy in your marriage, you're not ha going to be happy in your life. I mean, that's just the way it's going to work. And um, I don't know. I mean, I come from an individualistic country and uh, perhaps with selfish motives, but though I am not going to jump out and say everybody should get divorced. No, but I'm also going to be the one that says sometimes, sometimes there are occasions when it is in fact the best solution for everybody involved. And it, sometimes it's an economic thing, think equity theory, but sometimes it's um, the children as well. You know, whatever. Next time we'll finish, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back and we'll talk about, um, uh, again, more happier things. We're going to talk about helping behavior. And actually when we help other people because it it's a complicated thing and it's it's really interesting to talk about that there isn't really a helping personality factor there is no helpfulness personality trait you know it's, it's a situational characteristic for sure so i will see you the next time